In a recent interview, Stephen Wilson stated that the possibility of a porcupine tree reunion is probably not going to happen. And while this is extremely depressing, the band had a really good run. And of course, Stephen Wilson right now is having a great time with his solo career. The Porcupine Tree was a massively important band, one that really didn't start to get the recognition that they deserved until the 2000s, although the band had been really going since the late 1980s. So, in order to really chronicle the achievement of this potentially being Porcupine Tree as a career, being completely over, thanks to Stephen Wilson's words, we need to rank all their albums. Now, as a note, uh, Voyage 34 is not included on this list. I love that album. It's just a fantastic, fantastic uh, disc that's very different from the rest of their discography. However, it's most cases regarded as its own thing, that Voyage 34 was its own project under its own name. So it's not included here for that reason, but I highly suggest that you scope it out. So let's rank them all, Porcupine Tree. So we have to start with number 10, because there's 10 albums in their discography. And number 10 is On the Sunday of Life, and this is fair considering it was their first album, and really a collection of songs to begin with. In fact, this wasn't really even a full band album. We wouldn't get that until Signify, which was about three or four albums down the line. Now, this was Stephen Wilson's early recordings for the group, and then some new things that were factored in, all placed together uh, and to create this very strange, strange amalgamation of music, which was uh, one part psychedelic rock, one part progressive, one part uh, kraut rock influenced. There was a great track in the middle of this called Radioactive Toy that still remains to be one of my favorites, and I think also showcased what this band was definitely going to be capable of in the future. And the composition is just out there, it's very wild, it's very crazy, and that's what makes this kind of a really interesting album to go back and reflect on all of these years later. Number nine is Signify. This is the first uh, full band album that Porcupine Tree delivered, and it wasn't until album number four, I believe it is. And this is one that also uh, balked a little bit away from their traditional sound at that point, which was the psychedelic rock, the progressive rock that you heard on albums previous. So it was a bit of a shock to the system. And it, it, as a result, it really delivered an album that felt a little bit different, but at the same time, didn't quite carry the same amount of memory, despite of great albums, or excuse me, great songs such as Dark Matter being a part of this record. Uh, this is just a disc that doesn't really commit itself to your memory quite as well. It's not so much a weak point in their discography as that it's just one that you don't revisit nearly as often. Number eight is Stupid Dream, and actually, to me, it's an album that you know, very much suffers the same fate as Signify. It's one I just don't return to all that often. However, Stupid Dream has been an album that's been very favorably reviewed and favorably beloved by a lot of people. It's actually one of the albums that is on the 500 albums that you need to hear before you die list, or one of the 500 uh, greatest rock or heavy metal albums of all time. I believe it's in a 339 did the last edition. But Stupid Dream is just a progressive rock album that has a little bit more of its tinnings toward uh, some of the modern rock that you heard at that point during the late 1990s with Britain, only with a progressive twinge. Still a very good album that still has great memorable tracks, however it just didn't quite commit itself quite as well to my memory as perhaps it did to others. Number seven is Lightbulb Sun. Now, funny little trivia about CKN is that in the old AOL Instant Messenger days, my handle was Son of a Lightbulb, and it was absolutely influenced by this album, as it was one of the uh, Porcupine Tree albums that I had just heard. Now, this is an album that started to reflect a little bit more of a return to form from what you had heard uh, after Stupid Dream and Signify. This included songs such as Hate Song or Russia on Ice that were long, sprawling compositions that old school Porcupine Tree fans knew and absolutely loved. And while this was still an album that felt a little bit uh, sort of claustrophobic at times, or a little, it sort of had its own little um, idea about it, it wasn't too sure of its identity, this was an album that did feel a little bit more like it had some open space and open exploration. Like there was a lot more kind of coming from this disc that whatever was going to come next had the uh, possibility to be something major. The songwriting was heading in the right direction, and of course, the brutes would be rewarded much later. Number six is The Incident. This is the final release by Porcupine Tree, the epic uh, concept album that is just, it's one that honestly, whenever you hear it perform live, it sounds a lot better and feels a lot better than it did whenever we got from the studio. This almost feels like it was best reflected as a live experience. 
there's a lot of great things that can come from this album, and you get a great feeling of story, you do get a very linear fashion. This is almost like their version of Operation Mindcrime, if you will, considering there are a, there's a lot of tracks on this. This is one that has easily their most number of tracks on an album since On the Sunday of Life. And because of that, you get a lot of these sort of stop-start uh, the songs that are meant to sort of set mood or set tone, and it sometimes does the exact opposite. It instead destroys some of the momentum that the album has. However, whenever you hear it collectively, live, without any sort of interruption, it makes all the sense in the world, and everything is set up beautifully. It's almost like those little stop gaps really prevent some sort of visualization or cause that visualization to go a little bit dark for a moment. Not a bad album whatsoever, but still certainly we have some great, great places to tread. Number five is Deadwing. This is another conceptual release that was uh, originally supposed to be for a movie of some variety that has some really awesome songs on it. Whenever you listen to this uh, and you and you sort of go through everything, there's definitely a lot of themology of religion. There's a lot of themology of life, of depression, of, of personality, of, of everything. There's a nice uh, little... Uh, th 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 there's a lot that you can really gather and and received from this album, and it was a worthy follow-up at the time to In Absentia, which was seen as this marvelous release. So Deadwing certainly kept them on a heavier tread as well, as Deadwing could very well potentially be their heaviest album, if you can imagine that. Although there are certainly going to be some contenders before all is said and done. Number four is Up the Downstair, the first actual full-length release, but uh, you know, it's the second album that we got from this band after On the Sunday of Life, and this one, if you want a true classic from their 1990s discography. We're going to get to that, but this one's very close to being right on its heels. Uh, I, I just absolutely love the atmosphere that you get from this album. It has this spacey feel to it. It also is very psychedelic. It's something that can go off on its own tangent. It's something where it uses a little bit of electronic, uh, you know, guiding in order to give the, uh, the, the record a little bit of depth and it gives it a little bit of, you know, breath and life and a lot of different things. You know, you, you have songs such as Small Fish that are then countered by uh, tracks such as Burning Sky, so you have two and a half minutes to ten minutes, and there's, you know, little references to other tracks everywhere. This feels like the ultimate experience. It feels like a callback that has come for a band that didn't have anything to really call back on as of yet. It's just a really awesome first real full-length expression to the world, so definitely scope this album out. Number three is In Absentia, and if Deadwing is not their heaviest album, In Absentia may have some qualities on it that is their heaviest album. For a long time, many people uh, felt that this was the best Porcupine Tree album that was released, and it was because of the strength of the songwriting, which had this you know, power that was behind it. There was a lot of the serial energy that was behind Steven's very soft you know, register in his soft voice. There's songs on here that only need 20 words in order to complete a really powerful, you know, five to six minute long track, such as Gravity Islands, which is a superb example. The sound of music is very well respected. Wedding Nails, you have the sound that you get right at the beginning of that, which instantly stays in your head. Everything on this album feels like the real deal, the genuine article. It was a coming out party for, uh, Porcupine Tree after albums such as Lightbulb, Sun, and Stupid Dream. They really showed where all that creativity sort of came to a head, and they used all of their collective experience from the previous decade in order to release a true classic. Number two is The Sky Moves Sideways. This album could easily be seen as their Wish You Were Here, their Pink Floyd album, the album that really garnered a lot of those reputations that Porcupine Tree had a big time influenced by Pink Floyd, and that they were this generation's Pink Floyd, which is something that Stephen Wilson always really disliked. Uh, however, this album absolutely shows that. It, it very much feels a lot like Wish You Were Here with the long tracks that have a lot to really offer. The Sky Moves Sideways is a, a, a side of, uh, you know, by themselves having two of the longest run times with 13 minutes apiece or 17 minutes for the latter portion. And the songs that are right in the middle are all absolutely excellent also. This is an album that showed why that formula was very effective and why that formula caused uh, Pink Floyd to have, you know, albums that were very well remembered just by having mammoth tracks on them in the 1970s and why they still hold up today. The Sky Moves Sideways still holds up today. You can listen to this album all the way through and it feels like a seamless experience. It's very much still within the same vein as Up the Downstair, only a little bit more focused and a little bit more progressive. Check this album out. But that brings us to number one, 
which is fear of a blank planet. How can you go wrong whenever you have the best Porcupine Tree song of all time featured on your album, which is of course Anastize. This is just a massive album, one that really it not only registers so many different emotions, but also is able to channel so many different feelings. You have moments on this album where you feel genuinely depressed. You have moments where you feel like you are one of those smartest guys in the room that's talking about all the problems that are constantly going on in the world today. You have genuine emotion and mood that just shifts with each passing note, and it's what causes this album to have such a long memory to its listeners. And it's also one that has been bested by its own reputation. It's one that over the course of the past decade has only continued to improve whenever it comes to prestige, and continue to improve in how people feel about it. This is an album that, instead of not aging, well, aged better as it got older, almost as though whenever it was first released and given to the world, it was merely an infant, and needed some time to mature before it reached its full potential. It's amazing what this album can cause somebody to feel. And I'm really at one to agree with them. This is definitely the best Porcupine Tree album. For a long time, for me, it was The Sky Moves Sideways, hands down. But going through the discography once again, I realized that I was wrong. And I shouldn't have balked at Fear of the Blank Planet at number two, or even number three, under In Absentia. Instead, this is the gold medal, this is the top spot, this is the album that constantly is easy to return to, and because of that, it's their best album. But what about your list? Well, take these 10 albums, listen to them, give me your list in the comments below. I want to know what your number one Porcupine Tree album of all time is. I'm Cover Nation, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Thanks for all the music and the memories, Porcupine Tree. Have a great, great day.